This is an AI called a neural network, but all of the transistors and electronics are replaced with DNA, the molecule of life, all of that in one test tube. And by the end of this series, we're going to be connecting DNA neural networks to living cells. Imagine a world with programmable cells on board your body that can classify various diseases and create very optimized adaptations to them on the fly. Don't worry, this course is specifically made for computer scientists. So we'll start all the way from the most basic ATCGs you've learned about in high school to DNA logic gates, computing polynomials, connecting DNA computers to living cells and nanobots, and even a whole new paradigm of computation that involves using the three-dimensional properties and topology of DNA. So without further ado, let's get started. But before we even make AI using DNA, what sort of tools do we need to make just a traditional AI? Specifically, the type of AI we're going to be making is called a neural network. If you are already familiar with this type of AI, feel free to skip to the next section of the video. Otherwise, this will be a pretty good recap. This neural network is classifying symbols into their correct category. For example, these flame symbols should belong in the fire category. To us, this task is extremely trivial. I mean, they're both fire. But to a computer, all the pixel data are different. The type of stroke, the globs here and there, all look extremely different to a computer's eyes. So we turn to biomimicry for an answer, which is kind of funny because now we're trying to build this AI out of DNA. It's quite a full circle moment. Specifically, we're replicating a more simple version of the brain's network of neurons, hence the name neural network. The first layer is the pixel data of our image. And the last layer is the confidence level between 0 and 1 of what the network thinks the image is. The middle layers are what do the computation. Each neuron, like biological ones, can send and receive signals. For instance, the activation of this neuron should be based on the other two we see here. However, the activation of these two might not be equally important. So we assign a weight to both of these connections. We can also assign a threshold to make sure the activation we get isn't too low or too high. This is what we call a bias. And at the end, we want every neuron's activation to range between 0 and 1. So we use a function like a sigmoid to squish any input into this range. We can also compact every multiplication and addition operation into a matrix multiplication, where each neuron's activation is just the row of weights multiplied and summed by the column of activations from the previous layer, and then added to the bias and squish using the sigmoid. Matrix operations will be extremely important once we get into something called convolutional neural networks, which can detect actual patterns and trends within the images. That's all the mathematical tools you'll need for a neural network. Adding, multiplying, matrix operations, nonlinear functions like the sigmoid. So now the question stands, how do we make all this using something as unconventional as DNA? Isn't DNA just some molecule that makes up life? How does one go from that to neural networks? What you're about to see here is a transistor made out of DNA. First, let's take a look at the properties of DNA as a material. What are the rules behind how DNA interacts and functions? What can we exploit? You are probably familiar with this representation of DNA, the classic double helix. A pairs with T and G pairs with C. For simplicity, I'll represent this a little more abstractly as two straight strands. This isn't the only form of DNA though, you can separate the double strand into single strands. However, the instant you do this, the DNA will try to snap back together like magnets. A and T are like magnets with opposite poles. The same applies to G and C. Any other arrangement is unfavorable and makes the attraction between the strands weaker. We can say that A base pairs with T and G with C. Any two sequences that can base pair with one another are called complementary sequences. 
One quirk of DNA is that the ordering of the letter bases matter, and it is signified using this arrow. This is important because base pair DNA strands run anti-parallel with one another. If we have a complementary sequence but in the incorrect direction, they won't base pair properly. Keep this in mind when designing anything related to DNA. All of this leads up to the essence of DNA computing. Similar to how opposite pole magnets attract one another spontaneously, DNA wants to maximize the number of base pairs it can make to any given strand spontaneously. Let's test our understanding of this principle. Let's say you have two strands of DNA. There's only one region in these two that are complementary, like what you see here. What's going to happen? By all means, try to figure this out on your own. It's a very good exercise for your intuition. And if your answer is that they only bond where they're complementary, you're spot on. Like I said, DNA will try to make as many base pairs as possible. So this arrangement you see here is better than nothing. Similarly, if you have one strand here and there are two regions that are complementary on one strand, they'll spontaneously try to form base pairs and form this structure called a hairpin loop. This is actually the start of the 3D computing paradigm I alluded to earlier, so stay tuned for that. Now, we can get started on using these in creative ways to make our DNA computer. Let's return to the somewhat mismatched DNA we have from my first question. If we introduce a new strand that is much more complementary to one of the strands than the other, what do you think is going to happen? Remember the same golden rule, maximize base pairs. So the strand will actually ditch its old partner for a better one. And by shifting our view a little bit, this is basically a switch. The strand we put into it is our input, and the strand that pops out is the output. This type of reaction is called DNA strand displacement, or DSD for short. The part where the input DNA attaches first is called the toehold domain, and the displacing part is called, well, the displacement domain. And there you go, that's a basic buffer switch. But the transistor that we want isn't just a switch, right? It's a switch that only turns on based on a signal. Designing a transistor basically uses the same principles and ideas as the switch. The DNA will try to make as many base pairs as it can. We're going to have to be a little bit more clever because it needs both inputs to activate and not just either one of them. See these two sequences? You'll need both of them to make it send out an output, which is this strand at the end here. Let's explore this design. To push out the output, the logical answer might be to use the big one to push it out. If the big one tries to attach, it won't work, since the patterns don't fully match and it is happy the way it is. But when this yellow one attaches, it is a perfect match for its complement, so it will be taken out. As you can see, neither one is sufficient to send out the output. And with this yellow sequence, there are two complementary sequences in there, so it collapses into a hairpin. And once it does, that's when the other input can bind and displace the output. You need both to generate an output. This isn't just a transistor, it's also an AND gate. Of course, there are way more gates than an AND gate, so we'll explore more DNA logic gates in the next video. Now, I might have just said that this is an innocent digital AND gate, but it can act as a multiplier too. To understand how this works, let's take a look at a very simple reaction. A plus B makes AB, where AB is just one molecule. If there's 50 A and 20 B, you can make only 20 of AB, since if you run out of B, you can't physically make more of AB. Back to our AND gate, we can do the same. Add in 50 units of the input, and there will be 50 of the gates. And you can dump in however much of the other input you want. Let's just call this state high or 1. Then we'll be able to generate 50 of the output. This is 50 times 1 equals 50. We'll go into detail how to do math using DNA in its own video. But the upshot is that we can design circuits that can compute polynomials. And with polynomials, we can calculate any function we want, as most functions can be approximated using the Taylor series. Functions such as the sigmoid, our final piece of the puzzle. 
And there you have it. That's all the components you need for a neural network. But neural networks are huge, so you're going to need to know how to implement matrices into DNA. I'll show you the full numerical version in the following videos, but here's a Boolean version as a teaser. Let's make a small modification to the DNA strand displacement reaction I showed you earlier. We can chop up the toehold and displacement domains and add a linker. You need both pieces to activate the gate now. This way, we can make a clever system that can select which number of targets which. And this ability is crucial for matrix multiplication. Let's strip down matrix multiplication down to its essence. You multiply the row and the column element-wise, and then sum them together. In Boolean terms, you and these two pairs together, and then OR the result. These DNA will pair up only if the connectors are complementary. This represents an AND operation. If either one of these pairs are actually paired, it can interact with this gate to push out an output. This is the OR operation. So let's try multiplying this matrix with this vector for demonstration. And as you can see, the DNA results match that of the Boolean calculation. And that's it. That's a brief overview of how we can make all the components of a DNA computer. We went from exploiting the properties of DNA to create switches and transistors, and I gave you a glimpse of the arithmetic and logical prowess of these little molecules. We'll go into the depths of these operations in the next two videos. Then we'll combine these two into a DNA neural network and finally attach it to a living cell. So stay tuned and join me in this quest of a whole new and exciting paradigm of computation. Thank you immensely for watching.